In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Victory. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Brethren in Christ, Laudator Jesus Christus in, in secula. secula. This yeah. is Timothy Flanders with the meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. Welcome to the Monday Morning Show, Our Lady of Victory. We're renaming this show. It's a it's announcement of our new direction. We've got some wonderful things coming down the pike for Meaning of Catholic. I'm really excited. Um, one of those things is that this show is going to be the mission show of Meaning of Catholic. The I was really excited because the, the original music that we have in the, the intro was the original Ave Maria um, that we st started using like three years ago now. 2019 was when Meaning of Catholic began. Um and uh, Paleocrat was the first ever interview on Meaning of Catholic channel. The OG. The, four, the fourth episode. The, it was the fourth episode. It Not was, that he's keeping track. Yeah. yeah. You, well, you well you had like three videos that were like 15 <laughs> minutes long. And then there was mine. Yeah. Like some 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 haters have like commented like, why did you bring this dude, Jeremiah? I'm like, bro, he's been. Yeah. This is like a founding member of Meaning of Catholic. <laughs> yeah. you're like, where have you been? So yeah, OG. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. He is OG, the 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 OK original Kaiser or whatever. <laughs> um, so the, That's good. Let me explain this uh, image. And uh, Our Lady of Victory is not a title that is sometimes well known to some uh but this is the the painting here is one of the many depictions of the battle of lepanto and this is the painting that mrs flanders used for the cover of city of god versus city of man which is forms very much the historical manifesto of this whole apostolate but uh it's a wonderful painting because as you as you can see christ and the saints and the angels on the left side here are fighting uh, against the Mohammedans. Here we are with all the, our our forefathers fighting the Mohammedans at Lepanto. And then we have the devil and his angels fleeing in terror, of course. Uh, so Our Lady of Victory is the invocation of Our Lady on October 7, the Feast of Our Lady of Victory or Our Lady of the Rosary. Um, but the, the whole t motto of this apostolate is uniting Catholics against the enemies of Holy Church. And the idea of the fulfilling the new crusade of our time, which is against the enemies of the Holy Church, which the enemies take many different forms. The most important enemy is our own sin. First of all, that's if you're not dealing with your own sin, then you're going to get beaten by the, the physical enemies of the Holy Church. But we also have physical enemies, people who have been doing the bidding of the fallen angels, whether inside or outside the church. And we're fighting against them to overcome them and win them over to baptism or decrease their influence or save our children from their influence or various things like that. So uh, the whole manifesto, City of God versus City of Man, goes into great detail historically of this whole concept of uniting Catholic against the enemies of Holy Church, because I, I definitely see it as a historical uh, continuity in every age. There is this sort of overarching crusading movement, which helps to bring Catholics together to fight the good fight. And that's what this apostolate is all about. And so back in, um, let me see, where are we? Here we go. The Terror of Demons Morning Show with Kennedy Hall. We started this show a, cu a couple years after Meaning of Catholic in order to promote Kennedy's book, Terror of Demons. And initially, it was just a man show, which was really uh, promoting his book. But it has become this Monday morning show on Monday has become more of a meaning of Catholic show where we just debate everything under the sun and uh, we discuss things. And it just doesn't really focus on the man topics. In addition, Kennedy has just been strapped for his own commitments with life side and everything. So what we're going to do is we're going to refound the Terror of Demon show. We're going to do that once a month on the first Wednesday of every month. So that'll just be me and Kennedy talking man stuff. 
like all about his book and all all sorts of whatever. So guild members, we've already sent this to you. Send us your questions and comments and things that you want to talk about for that show. So we're going to record that show we'll, and we'll premiere it every first Wednesday for St. Joseph. Um, because we've definitely acquired St. Joseph Terror Demons as another patron of this apostolate after Our Lady of Victory. Um, but that's what we're going to do. So we'll do the man show once a month, and then we'll do this this Monday morning Our Lady of Victory show. That'll be every single week, but it'll be more that this show will will continue with what we really have. It's become it's become more than a man show on Monday morning. It's more of a Our Lady of Victory rallying cry for the week. We talk about the the coming week. Um, we talk about to different topics today. We, we, we typically have, um, we've typically had, um, people have always, heard, uh, many Catholics have heard of Martin Luther nailing the 95 theses on Wittenberg door or whatever. Well, that act actually was in fact, a very Catholic action that he stole from the Catholics at the time. He was really still a Catholic. The 95 theses, if you read them, are actually quite Catholic themselves, but, um, the idea of nailing a thesis, a bunch of theses on a door to debate. That's what Catholics used to do at the time. And that's something that we want to restore the concept of the rival schools of Christendom that have been lost, uh, this concept of debating these different things. So that's what we've been already doing on this show. That's what we're just going to continue to do. So Paleocrat today is going to nail his five theses of presuppositionalism, and we're going to debate that or whatever. I don't. I probably will agree with everything you say, so I don't know if it'll be a debate. <laughs> but um this is what this show will be about. So without, but speaking of the week, let's talk about what we have. Today is the great feast of St. James, Santiago de Compostela, a great feast of Hispanidad. Uh, I'm really excited about the the article at 1 Peter 5. Th these are the articles that that we don't get a lot of view readership at 1 Peter 5, uh, an article about architecture and music. Doesn't really get the clicks, but I love these. I love these articles. Uh, St. James today. Um, and um saint anne tomorrow and let's see what else we have this is the seventh sunday after pentecost and uh saint martha late in the week and once again you can go to liturgyofthehome.com to get this beautiful calendar and uh fowler what's happening with you this week are we on part 87 of of the <laughs> series? that feels like it doesn't it um i've been a real little remiss i didn't prepare as quite well as i thought i would last week so i was i was hoping to have uh episode 21 of the first eight ecumenical councils written and thumbnail produced and video produced but it didn't happen um i'd like to lay the blame on everybody but me but the fact is here's the problem right here so yeah this week is the the goal is not only do i have to prep for school which starts in less than a month now uh, but to hammer out the last episode of ecumenical councils, not the last one ever, but the last one for now. And then, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. That was my alarm clock. Sorry. So, well, yeah, anyway, uh, part 21, we'll look at the eighth ecumenical as, as it is recognized in the West, not in the East. And then we're shifting gears. We're going to do some other Catholic things. So like I'm going to, I'm going to start picking up, uh, on a, an author who's not very well known, kind of well known. Um, people, when you hear the name, you'll be like, Oh, that guy, uh, Romano Guardini. I like his stuff. I think other people will like it too. If they get a chance to read it, most people just real, they hear Guardini and they're like, Oh, isn't that that modernist fella? <laughs> and I just kind of shake my head. I'm like, no, that's, that's not right. So, anyhow that's that's where we're at uh and then i've got i've got to make sure my house is adequately prepared we're having some company coming in from out of town but other than that yeah pretty pretty slow week this week your your mic is muted, right? you. muted. that was a your mustache uh, must have hit the button yeah <laughs> thankfully thankfully uh the roman pontiff quoted guardini like three times in in the new desiderio desert that's Duravi, which is wonderful. Uh, that, that was a great uh, addition to the, I think it was an apostolic letter. So, yeah, Guardini is not, uh, certainly not a modernist. I, 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 I think I mentioned this in the show before. He has this critique of 
the modern architecture that that is in, mm -hmm. in through industrialization, which is invading modern Italy at the time, which I read in the the Catholic environmentalism book, which I love. Anyhow, uh, Paleocrat. Yeah. Um, do you want to preview of Paleocrat Diaries this week? What's going on with you? Well, I want to go. I made some decisions recently, uh, in part because we were joking beforehand about how, you know, you you know that I'm making a lot of these videos, but they're longer. And that can be difficult, you know, and I'm just so accustomed to years spent being on radio for like two or three hours a day that it's been a weird thing coming over to YouTube and having to adjust to a completely different medium. And I finally figured it out. It took a year. And I said, you know, I need to make shorter videos, too. And so one of the things that I'm going to be doing is making shorter videos uh, more uh, even over on my own channel at Paleocrat. Uh, doing stuff that's uploaded to paleocratdiaries.com. And I've already been putting it together and following the devout life, for example. That's one of the things. So some of it will be more practical. Some of it will be more political, um, talking about constructive things, not just simply reactions to uh, news and, you know, poking fun and poning liberals and stuff. <laughs> that's easy. That's like low hanging fruit to me. And so and I think we're in a bad place. I think we're in a wicked, a wicked place in the world. And it's looking pretty dire. And so we need to put our heads together and actually have something more than just giggles. Um, so I want to be part of that constructive process. And so other than that, uh, I'm finishing up a, a, a series that I'm doing on, on presuppositionalism. And I'm following Colin, uh, Colin Causey's essay on the matter. It's excellent. And uh, talking about that, I have one more show that. And then I'm going to do, I'm going to get back to the cult stuff too. So there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes as to like what we're planning to do and what it's going to take, but it's a lot of smaller things. So it'll be, it'll be easy to do pre-recorded too. So I can do it whenever I want. Um, so that's going to be a whole bunch of fun. And we're going to be going down very soon. In fact, we're going to be going down to go visit the Fowlers. And so that's going to be a lot of fun. I haven't been to St. Louis in a very, very long time. And so my kids have never been there. My wife, my wife has never been there. And so that's going to be, that's going to be a blast. Yeah. Are you guys going for the the festival? Well, we're we're going, yeah, Remember? for the festival called the Fowlers. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> it's called hang no, out dude. with the man. No, I mean we just we we had such a good time, and honest to goodness, you know, it's like it's really cool to have people come here. I mean, we're going to be having uh, Veronica's coming to Grand Rapids. She's from England. She's one of the admins in the chat, um, and she's going to be in Grand Rapids uh, for I think four days or so, five days. And um, and so but we never get out ourselves. So people come and they visit, but we don't really get out very often. I don't even know the last time we had a vacation. So we're like, we need to just go and just really enjoy ourselves. And we thought, where would we want to go? And we knew where we wanted to go. And so Sweet. we connected with people. fantastic. The, the, the yeah. so-called Midwestern state of Missouri. Yeah, right, right. right. No, that came from I, we're I the, know, the, Midwest, the lower Midwest. But, uh, the I don't know how to snow to be Midwest, but. <laughs> Anyhow, enough. All due respect to Missouri, the most uh, pro-life state of the union, I think. So this is what I'm really excited about is Mary, Queen of the Home. This is our ladies group that is uh, led by our ladies, namely Haley, Ashley and Kyleshka. And I'm going to have these three ladies on the show Wednesday night at 9 p.m. And we're going to be this is the public launch of. Mary Queen of the Home group. Uh, it is a ladies group. Well, there's um, it's le led by ladies, I should say. It's a co-ed group on Telegram, but it's just talking all things domestic church, all things domestic church. What will pre what um, the ladies will be presenting on Wednesday night is Kyleshka and the and uh, Haley and Ashley have put together this beautiful and wonderful, very comprehensive list of resources for homeschooling we already have the resources for uh catholic doctrine on the website but we will have these resources for homeschooling if you've ever thought about homeschooling if you've tried homeschooling and you've been frustrated uh this is going to be good news because we've tr we've collected all of the greatest resources that are out there and given them a description, a, a review, everything we can do to really enable parents to homeschool. And this, but this group is not only going to be homeschool, it's also going to be uh, family spirituality, uh, family leisure, navigating modern technology, all things domestic church, parenting, kids, 
et cetera, et cetera. So I'm really, really excited about this group because uh, just the, and and if you know any of these ladies, they're awesome. Uh, they're awesome ladies, women of God who really provide the backbone of their own families. And they provide the, this, this incredible and very, very important backbone to the, the mission that we're trying to do here at Meaning of Catholic, which is, one of the aspects of this, of Uniting Catholic Against the Eminence of the Holy Church, is helping parents be parents, which is difficult nowadays, especially in our in our day and age. So really excited for this group, Mary Queen of the Home. So you be, sh- be sure to tune in Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. So that'll be me and uh, Kailashka, Ashley, and Haley talking about the homeschooling resources and this whole group um, that'll be coming very soon. So. Stay tuned for that. And then later today, we have Eric Ibarra for our final final uh, installment of Recognize and Resist Week. And Eric Ibarra will be presenting his critique of the Recognize and Resist in the show tonight. That'll be at 6.30 p.m. tonight. Are trads not traditional? Question mark. Eric Ibarra says, yes, they are not traditional. So we'll be discussing that tonight. So Please support Meaning of Catholic. You can go to patreon.com slash Meaning of Catholic, or you can donate. You can have access to all the Guild community and the Guild content and free books. And without anything further, let's get into our topic. Paleo crap. Let's see. What are What is the most basic thing about presuppositionalism? All, all I know is that you can presupp- we can, you can make a presupposition about uh, about something. Well, you yeah, have, yeah, you method. have one. Yeah, you have a you you have a presupposition. Everybody does. Um, a presupposition is just the most basic, fundamental, foundational um, idea that you have, right, about the world. So, or about morals, or w- what's the grounding of these things? The foundation, uh, whereupon, and the framework wherein and where from uh, our ideas come regarding the world, and it can get confusing because. The claim that that I'm making and that other presuppositionalists make, and there is a difference, and that's what the, my series has been about. Colin Causey's essay is 30, what, 34 pages long, uh, printed out, right? Small, easy margins, tiny print. So it's a very long essay, and he's going through describing the differences, and he was inspired in large part by various series that I had done, um, saying there this is a viable option, this is a viable method. And a lot of the criticisms against it are not any good. Um, But the idea is everybody's got it. What makes it difficult is that the contention is that everybody is operating off of presuppositions that are, in fact, um, connected to their being creatures created in the image of God. And that the way that I describe it, and there are differences on this, but the way I do, I take the Bonaventurian position and the the line of Augustine and company that says that the first uh, the first thing to fall into the mind, into the intellect, in fact, is the knowledge of God. And so from the very beginning for for Bonaventure, that's the first thing, which is why he has a position on um, uh, illuminationism, uh, the idea of like the light of God sh- shedding light on this and that it returns to the source. Can you Basically, explain what what do you mean by that? The first thing that falls into the mind. Yeah. So it's the, it's it's the thing from which um, one way to conceptualize it is to think of it as a framework. So if you have a blank slate, right, and it's just a blank board and there's nothing in it and you're just getting input, you have nothing to contextualize that input. It's just one thing. You wouldn't be able to say that's hard because you wouldn't even know what soft is. There'd be nothing to that. Right. So you say, well, how do we gather that then? I mean, if we're if we're basing it one thing off another thing off another thing, each one, it would be relatively incoherent. Um, for example, you know, I've, I've joked and said, like, if, if I were to get something from another planet and it were to be a squiggly symbol and then I got a triangle and then I got another one, I can come up with any narrative I want. But unless I'm somehow connected in a way that I can actually know that. Um, and know it in a way that is more certain than I'm speculating my brains out. <laughs> and we'd be doing that with each and every individual thing from the moment we start. And so the idea is that that you begin, in fact, 
with the knowledge of God from the get-go. It makes sense out of Romans 1 that you would say you suppress this truth, this thing you know, in exchange for a lie. And that you would rather not give glory to God, but you would rather instead give glory to uh, the, the works of your own hands, even to the point of absolute absurdity by worshiping something that you made <laughs> as though that was God itself. So the level of absurdity is not intellectual because that's just plainly evident that that's not the God that made you because you made it. It's a moral problem. So is, is St. Bonaventure saying the the dog basically the dogma of Vatican Wayne, namely that you can know God by reason alone and it's not the supernatural revelation of God, but it's the knowledge that there is a God by reason alone. Is that what you're saying? Like you can just well, no, you, the fact that there's you can't deny that you use reason that, that you would be able to use reason. The idea that reason uh, operates completely detached from the fact that you're an ensouled creature already um, is fake. <laughs> like so, it can't mean that, right? Because we our reason is happening within an ensouled creature. Um, our it's happening within a creature that has conscience. So when we talk about God and we use examples like w when um, when questions about morality come up and people say, well, if you don't have God, then where do you get your morals from? Right. It's not just a hypothesis they're talking about. Right. They're actually talking about an entity. They're talking about a, a, a being. And we're ultimately talking about being the first concept of being even neo scholastics. A lot of them have accepted this idea that you have to have at least a concept of being. Um, or else you wouldn't even know that you're you. So the I think, therefore I am, or I am, therefore I'm thinking doesn't matter either way because you're a being. So you have to have a concept of being in order to even, even say this. So for Bonaventure and for Augustine, the and for Anselm, the idea it's, it's underlying his ontological argument that the, and not everybody, by the way, who's a presuppositionalist is Bonaventurian. I'm just saying from my perspective, from where I am. So there's others. There's, in fact, Colin Causey's Thomistic. We have him and I have disagreements. He's he came into this uh, disapproving of presuppositionalism and has since come to accept presuppositionalism and wrote maybe one of the best <laughs> essays on it that I've ever read. And he's a Thomist. So, you know, so we so we get along. We have our own little in-house debates on different topics and stuff. Um, so the idea uh, is that the very first thing to fall into the intellect, according to Bonaventure. Uh, in fact, I've got the quote. Let me just pull it up right here. So what I'm hearing you saying is that presuppositionalism is a method of uh, basically epistemology first in the sense that we have a basically presuppositionalism is saying that everybody presupposes something you're saying that what they what they presuppose is the knowledge of god uh just sort of intuitively uh but not explicit not ex right. oh, people not don't explicit. Explicit. okay yeah. but it is a it, it's it i would i would call that intuitive but it is an act mm -hmm. of reason itself because it's eminently reasonable or an act of logos as i might say um so that's just something that you intuit first it's yeah. It in, fact, it, in fact, in fact, you're programmed with it. I mean, it's it's part. It's it would be, but it's not total. So you're not seeing into the beatific vision. That'd be raging heresy, right? So it's not ontologism. In fact, there's an excellent book. Let me see here. Ugh. This right here. This book. If people have not, uh, if people have not seen this before, Caritas and Primo. Um, this is by Dr. Jared Isaac Goff. He's an amazing guy. Um, I'm supposed to talk to him here soon enough on the phone. Um, he's the one who said Bonaventure's your guy. He was really happy about the, the he teaches um, in a seminary. I, I'm trying to think if it's um, Byzantine, the Byzantine yeah, seminary. Yeah, Imperial Methodius Seminary. Yep, in yep. So, so it's the Byzantine seminary. It's where he teaches. And, uh, and he was really excited about the idea that I was doing this series. Um, and now I know why. <laughs> I, I started reading and I'm like, okay, yeah, his whole... Bonaventure over and over and over and over again. And he has a, he has a history of the situation with Pastor Eternus, uh, a situation about Vatican I, questions that came up about the Franciscans, the questions about the, is it is it the, um, trying to remember the, the group, which is the, which one's the group that split because they wanted to go back to Bonaventure and not SCOTUS? 
Anyway, there's there's a group oh, with this. I've right? never heard of that group. I don't know. Yeah, about that. and hmm. so so they they said, look, we believe the the Bonaventure. He's really the 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 head of this thing more than Scotus. Um, and so there was kind of a split with that. But um, but the idea he goes and he talks about the history of it. Um, but the the basic idea, and I was trying to find this here, the first thing known by us right here. Um, so let's see. Okay, first thing. Let me see. Okay, so for that, for that in which we know all things and through which we judge all things we know. So he's saying the thing that we know, all things, okay, isolated instances, and through which we judge all things we know, so judgments that we make, things like that, is the first thing known to us. Just as light is known by the eye. Oh, no, that, that would be, I'm sorry, that, that's uh, um, Thomas sounding a lot like him, actually. <laughs> so... Oh. Yeah, it's not, uh, yeah, it is. It is. Wow, first, you just yeah. quoted well, his no, arch enemy he by uses, mistake. He uses that, basically the same thing. Um, and so the the light cool. analogy that he's using, basically saying the first thing known to us is like the light and that the light shines on every object that we see and that every object that we see, we could not see if it were not for this light. But it's easy for us to get bedazzled by the colors and the shapes and the, everything else, the movements. And we don't even factor in the idea that it takes light in order for us to see that so, so, so that let me, give, yeah. let me let me try to give an example see if i understand this so like my atheist friend comes along and says uh i am passionate for justice and we, we must have justice in the world and i that's what i'm fighting for or whatever but in order to have justice you have to presuppose that there is a real thing called justice and it, when it's not just a nominalist world where there people are just imposing their wills on each other there is an actual thing called justice, which in which which exists objectively, sort of in a Platonic form world at the very least. But I would I would claim that that would be actually be part of God. You'd be have to presuppose that justice is God. God is yes. justice in order to oh, yes. even fight for justice. Otherwise, and I found the quote. By the way, I'm so is, is that a correct? Yeah. Am I being a presuppositionalist there? Well, this yes, sim very similar. So, like with with this, it, it would mean what do you do from there? Because that's I think most Catholics would believe that, right? That they would say that justice. It's not that we're like taking a little piece, piece here, a little piece there, and then we're just calling it justice in the fullest sense. We could say we can do that. We can come up with natural ideas regarding justice. So you can take philosophy detached from divine revelation and go in and look around at the world and piece things together and come up with various models that have things about it that would be worthwhile things about it that may be true um in part too because of the assistance that you're getting from the fact that you have a conscience and that you're an ensouled creature <laughs> and that you're living and moving and having your being in the world that god created but more more than that he says this um and this is the quote and i'm sorry that i had it confused because the the article is called Bonaventure's Critique of Thomas Aquinas. It's over at um, Church Life Journal. Oh, yeah, uh, right. I saw yeah, that and saved it, but never read it. Right. Totally awesome. But he says this. He says, um, he says it all comes down to Exodus 315, he who is. So he's saying all the, the thing, those things that are, right, is that they are uh, because of that, because God is the ultimate in this sense. And it says bon Bonaventure insists, quote, what first falls into the intellect is divine being. This would be illuminationism from which it follows that quote, it is impossible for him to be thought not to be. Okay. So he takes the ontological argument. He says, you can't even think that God doesn't exist in no way. Can you think that God doesn't exist in the same way? He goes further later and we kind of jumped ahead. I want to, I'll, I'll get back to the actual definition <laughs> of presuppositionalism here, but, but I'll say this. He also said his existence is so evident in itself and certain for the knower. So every person in the world, it's so evident and it's so certain that if he would rightly consider it, there's no way for the truth to be removed, for it is a truth most evident and most present, which is absent from no place, no time, no thought, which is not the case with any other created truths. That would include, by the way, um, it, you know, any, any other truth you can think of any, uh, uh, law of logic and everything else, it, all these things, insofar as they're certain, they are, they are certain because of the very reason that, uh, we know those things with certainty at all. And the way that we know those things with certainty is in fact, because of the very first thing that falls into the intellect. And that would be divine being. 
you do not see it explicitly. You see it implicitly. If you saw it explicitly, you're, as I said, you'd be in, you'd be beatific vision. So you, you have, and, and it's not, it's not only that it's in, it's, you also have natural faculties, other things, but with that, you would be able to connect to knowledge outside that would be able to give you a degree of certainty because the question that he was concerned with had a lot to do with questions about certainty, probability, things like that. And he said, the only way to, to get that is to be able to connect our thoughts, which are all isolated. There are sensory experiences, other things like that, that we're looking out in the world. I see this, I, I say, I see you guys. And I say, you guys are, I'm talking to you guys right now. Well, maybe I'm hallucinating, right? I can, I can throw it into probabilities, although maybe I'm hallucinating. But like the thing is, is that uh, the idea is if we're taking it off of one small particular plus one small particular plus one small particular, let's say we have a million, let's say we have 10 million particulars in our web and we create a web of that. We, we would then say, well, this is what I, what I say is the relationship between those particulars. And people have just said, you can then extrapolate and throw that out into the universe and say, that is true all over the universe. It's a universal law. The question is, if we can only know based on individual experience, individual experience, individual experience, that web, that's the border. You can't, you cannot speak in with certainty beyond that. In fact, it, you'd be pressed without God as a presupposition to be able to say that outside of your web, of your story, of your data points, your story, that that's true for anybody else but you. You would have to then, because they would have their web too. And this person has their web too. And everybody's got their little webs. And you say, how do we then say anything at all about universals? How do we say things with certainty? Yeah, that, and, that, that, yeah. that seems to be the a critical piece. Let, let me, I, I'm sorry to interrupt once again. I'm just trying to like throw this back at you so I understand what you're trying to say because uh, I'm not following everything you're saying, Jeremiah. But yeah. <clears throat> what I'm what I'm thinking is, I had this actual conversation with an atheist and she said, um, well, I don't believe in God because God is not just because God creates people and predestines them to heaven or hell. And he knows whether or not they're going to be good. So that's not just he shouldn't yeah. even he shouldn't even create that person. That's unjust. But then yeah. I think, well, you couldn't even have a standard of justice unless you presuppose that God exists. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So am mm -hmm. I am I being a presupposition? Is this a presupposition that, well, method that I just employed when I talked with her? Yes and no. Classical people will be like, they'll howl. At, they'll be howling if they if I say yes. But at the same time, that's the same thing I do on any other thing. I say because here's the definition. <laughs> All this while, 20 minutes in, what is presuppositionalism? A guy named Alberto A asked it on telegram and a guy named Lightspeed wrote the answer. And I was in a chat when he wrote it because he likes my stuff. And it was so good that I said, I'm going to use it. <laughs> Apologetic methodology that compares different worldviews. So your ideas about metaphysics, your ideas about ontology, epistemology, ethics, teleology, that, that network of, of ultimate assumptions that you have. And though that network is your worldview as a system as a whole. And it says you compare different worldviews and argues for the worldview that's actually capable of explaining the nature of reality, existence, whether God exists or not, etc. I would add to that by saying, in this case with you, how do you have morals if God doesn't exist? And we can reduce that to absurdity by saying anything they say, there was a, a great example of this, a dude, I don't know if it's Adam Green or what his name is, atheist guy, and he's like, he was talking to classical theists. And, and at first I was kind of critical of classical theists, but I, I need to take that back and say, sorry, because I think sometimes in real debate, people don't hear stuff. And I think if he would have heard it, he would have just ravaged the guy. But basically he asked him the question, classical theists did. Well, if you don't have, because the guy was saying the same thing, God's, God's terrible. He's evil. He did this and that. And he said, well, if you don't have God, what's your standard? How, how would you have any kind of universal standard for good and evil that would be applicable at all times and all places? to everybody and the, and the dude in real time said i don't know but i know that's evil <laughs> that is a joke right and so right. we we can totally do the irrational same. yes yeah. it's irrational but we can do the same thing with people's with epistemology and say okay so you you believe that your worldview says that either everything is one or everything is many 
So you have, that's the two primary categories that most, most groups have this thing, right? Where you, you either begin in this with a monad, right? And we're all one or on the other side, you have atom, atomism. And so you've got, everything's diverse and you can see the way the different cultures express that. Um, and the difficulties they have balancing that. We are the only worldview that's got a trinity <laughs> that says it is an equal ultimacy of the one and the many, and that the natural order, including ourselves, is reflective of the equal ultimacy. And you go, so it, the, the, the trinity does not annihilate and obliterate the oneness of God. And the oneness of God does not absorb the Trinity. So you would have, you would still be able to talk Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's not a joke. You're not a modalist, right? And at the same time, you're not a polytheist or a pantheist. And so no matter what worldviews out there, and the, the reason why that's so important, and I love the the a school of thought that's called um, um, Trinitarian ontology, um, the ideas that are coming out with this, the way that they're studying this, because it's a truly Christian ontology that says we're not just, and I love that Benedict talked about it and said, we're no longer talking strictly about this kind of regime and domination of just being or substance, but also relation. Mm -hmm. And that's because we're Trinitarian. So, so uh, um, you would not have that with, let's say the Greeks, for example, they wouldn't right. have it the same way. We do have that. And so yeah, we, it makes sense of how we know the world, because if we don't have the one and the many, if we don't have that, then we wouldn't be able to distinguish between me and you or because we would all be one, right? Like we're all one, bro. And you're like, okay, I'll punch you in the face and we'll see how it works. So like that's <laughs> right away. We can just show this or hop into that fire. And they're like, dude, I don't want to hop in that fire. And I'm like, what do you mean a fire? That's actually just you. Like you can, like right, right. it's obviously not one. Yeah. On the other hand, it's not many either without the unity, because people, if you say hop in that fire, it's a different fire than the one you jumped in that gave you third degree burns. They'll be like, but it's fire, and you're yeah. like, you, you don't know, you never right. know. This is just basically this. Hmm. Not, I mean, this is basically just applying logos to everything. Uh, but you're saying everything. That, um, the yes. The Greeks, the Chinese, the Indians, various high civilizations understood that the universe was governed by Logos yep. or Tao or Rita, whatever language you speak. But they did not have the revealed Logos of the ultimately the Holy Trinity, which explains the Logos of the entire universe, as you said, the one of the many. Um, yeah. But Jeremiah, can you? And after this, I, I do want to get Fowler. I want your comments because I've been. Well, just I was just soaking to, it up. I understand uh, Paleocrat here, but Paleocrat, can you share your screen? Do you have that written down? That uh, definition of presuppositionalism. Is I can I can share it if somebody wants to share it in the yeah. chat. So, yeah. You know, if you just click, if you click mm. share on the bottom, I can put this up on the screen. Just if you if you're able to share. Yeah. Your, let me, here, hold on. Let me, but, let me see. Um, <clears throat> So, yeah, I really like what you're saying because I've really um, that's been very impactful on my own spiritual life is learning about worldviews. Weltschung, that's the German word I always mm -hmm. like to use because German words are fun. Uh, but yeah, the the underlying presupposition of one's own thought and uh, getting to the root seems to be a very it's a shortcut. It seems to be a shortcut apologetically. It's it like, does, let's just it? go to these roots. Because that's the thing that explains all of your arguments. Uh, it's it's like saying, but why? But why? But why? Okay, here we go. Yeah. So, Here's, yeah. So, so what you, is presupposition? If you zoom in. So, zoom yeah. in really far if you can. Um, I or, don't know. You can't zoom in? Well, yeah. Okay, well. let, me, let me, like, yeah. I could enter full screen. Let me see if that change. Tell me if it changes anything. Yeah. A little bit. But. No, nah, it doesn't. It doesn't really. Anyways. <laughs> Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Hold, hold on. We'll, we'll have to uh, put that in a comment or something. Yeah. You could, if you copy and paste it, I can put it in the, like, pin it as a, as a comment. Yeah. yeah. Let me go ahead. Let me go ahead and do that. Yeah. So I Sorry. wanted to ask, and uh, this was a question that was raised in the chat. I don't think it was directed towards anyone in particular, but Paleocrat, what, what do you think you can do with this one? Uh, it's from Justin the Catholic. He says, 
you, you were speaking about uh, God is the first thing that falls into your mind and not explicitly, but implicitly. And I take that to mean uh, when you say implicitly that you have a knowledge of being itself because you exist and other things that you experience exist. So whether you can articulate that or not is one thing, but you have that intuitive knowledge, like Tim said a moment ago. So, so Justin says, what do you mean by God? All men act toward an end. Some replace the living God with the idol of their own image. Yeah. And so that kind of ties into what Tim was saying a moment ago with the Chinese and the Greeks and the Indians. Yeah, there it is. Um, well, I'll if, answer. If, yeah, well, go ahead. Finish what you're saying. Well, just, just to, to kind of, you know, round out the, the concept. If everyone has this concept, why do we have such a variety of answers when someone seeks a religious question? Well, if we're all starting yeah. from the same plane, you know? Yeah. Well, and the reason why, and, and it's, it's verifiable, just to be clear, it's verifiable that everybody is in fact starting off of that um, because it's the only worldview that can actually make sense of it when pressed to the limit. So if you take a position, so for example, this is an extreme one. You take a person who's new age, right? The new age person that comes up to you all smoked out on a bunch of hashish and a bunch of, you know, nag champa and patchouli on their body. And they come up and they're like, hey, man, we're like, me and you are like totally one. The universe is all one. And they say, hey, dude, like, can you go grab me those two beers over there? All, already in that sentence, they have betrayed the fact that something is not right going on in the brain. And it's not just that they have a dumb idea because they believe that. They buy all the jewels and the crystals. Their house has all the stupid posters that they got, right? With the frogs, psychedelic frogs and stuff. These people are embarrassing themselves publicly, not as a joke. They genuinely believe that. On the other hand, they cannot escape the fact that they are created in the image of God and that the very first thing that fell into their mind, even before they knew it, was in fact the uh, what Bonaventure talks about. And in that case, their, on, their worldview would not make sense. It wouldn't make sense because they're they're recognizing manyness in a worldview that says we're all one. Or on the flip side, take somebody who doesn't believe and says they believe in relativism. Okay. They say, yep, there's no such thing as right or wrong. Those folks are constantly going out protesting all the time. And they're constantly wanting everybody to get banned off social media all the time. And then they'll tell everybody, yeah, there's no such thing as right or wrong. I'm intolerant of intolerance. They say the stupidest junk or there's no such thing as absolute truth. People genuinely believe that. They say they believe it. But we all know it takes one question. <laughs> is that absolutely true? If they say no, they've betrayed themselves. If they say yes, they've betrayed themselves. Either way, what's been revealed is you have an espoused presupposition and an ultimate one that they cannot help but to rely upon. They can't help that. They can help this. And this part is the will. And that's why Bonaventure, when he talks about it, he says, look, he says, it's a matter of the will. If they want to think rightly, you know how easy it was to bring up the, the relativism and the absolute truth stuff? We've all been there. Anybody in this chat, Money Down says you've been there. So you know that it is not hard and it's not a matter of intellect because even if you bring that up, they're still scrambling. They're scrambling for anything. Why? Why are they scrambling? Is it, the, is it the intellect? Or is it the will? Is it sin? And Romans 1, it is clearly evident to them. God made it evident to them. And yet, even with all of nature proclaiming his glory, <laughs> all of it, we live and move and have our being in him. Everything is by him, of him, and in him. Romans 11, the end of Romans 11, I think, Romans 10 or 11. At the end of that chapter, talking about of him, by him, in him. To glory, to him be all the glory forever. Amen. It's all harmonized here. And yet somehow, magically in that world, we believe that there are people who say, I've never seen any proof. <laughs> Dude, that is a lie. In fact, the argument itself using words betrays them can you Jeremiah, can you just forward that telegram to me on telegram and i yes. will put it up yeah. on the screen so everybody can read this we can just read through this definition 
I think on the screen would probably be helpful. And I can you, share it you, to you on Telegram. Yeah, they just send it to yeah, me on Telegram. I will right now. It seems like that that a little bit it answered Andrea's objection here. He says, I wish Jeremiah's presuppositionalism would be true. Unfortunately, most people live not only in total absence of any idea of God, but also of morality and of a natural order, like the deists recognize. Presuppositionalism yeah, but, yeah. is too optimistic, in my view, and kind of undermines the truth of original sin, which casts a dark shadow on all humanity. It sounds like that's not. Yeah, no. It sounds yeah. like it sounds like Andrea. It sounds like you might be misunderstanding Jeremiah to think that he's saying that people are basically theists automatically. I, I don't hear that's what you're saying, Jeremiah. Well, but, they're not theists in the sense that they believe by divine faith, that they believe mm -hmm. in the dogmas of the Catholic Church, that sort of a thing but they would all fall under this category, okay? So for example, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and injustice of those men that detain the truth of God in injustice because that which is known of God is manifest in them. For God hath manifested it unto them for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made his eternal power also and divinity so that they are inexcusable. And then it goes further. And this is important because it has a note with it because that when they knew God, they have not glorified him as God or given thanks. So they knew God, but they did not glorify him. In what way did they know? How was it explicit, implicit? Was it, you know, like what, when did that happen for professing themselves to be wise? They became fools. They changed the glory. They changed it of the incorruptible God and the likeness and the image of corruptible man. And it goes on and says how they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. And as they liked not to have God in their knowledge, God delivered them up to a reprobate sense and do those things which are not convenient. <laughs> so you go, okay, that's an interesting thing. Um, because what you're dealing with here is that it's clearly made known to them. It's clearly manifest in them. And that's what Augustine talked about. That's what Anselm talked about. That's what Bonaventure talked about. And that's what so many moderns would like to imagine that never happened. <laughs> that those things that this, this doesn't make sense in, in, in certain ways of looking at it, it would turn into, well, they have the capability to. And you're like, well, yeah, but that's, so God's wrath isn't revealed against others for ungodliness and injustice. Are they, are they going against their own conscience? Is that what they're doing? Um, there's another passage, and I wish I had, hey, let, I wish me, I had better notes. I yeah. just got, here, I just got this up. Let me just, let me just read this through. And I want to read it through. So I, I think I'll, so I will understand it if you don't mind. Um, yeah. Presuppositionalism is an apologetic methodology that compares different worldviews and argues for the worldview that is actually capable of explaining the nature of reality, existence, whether God exists or not, etc. So a Catholic presuppositionalist would ultimately make arguments that go something along the lines of the Catholic worldview being the only possible worldview that could make sense of reality because all other worldviews fall into contradictions and absurdities if their view of reality is true. The point of presuppositionalism is to test the coherence of different worldviews upon their capability of being intelligible reality itself. That's a great definition, I think. Um, yeah. What here's, yeah. here's well, so here, my immediate question. Like this seems eminently reasonable to me. My immediate curiosity is why does anybody have a problem with this? Well, because, and I, I would encourage people. I'd encourage people to pick up this book here. I, oh, I'll just say because I'm not on the screen. It's okay. Yeah, I, I I'll, 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 Yeah, that don't have to be. Oh, there I am. Yeah. So the history of apologetics, Avery Cardinal Dulles. There is a kind of triumphalism that goes on and that's gone on for a little bit here regarding certain methodologies as if that was just that's over. These are it's set in stone. These are the primary methodologies that we use. We start from foundationalism and that's all it is. And that's the way it is. This book demonstrates that that narrative is totally fake. <laughs> this is this is a history of the various different methods that have been throughout, including modern times including some of the more popular uh, apologists, including JP2 and the things that JP2 said and the people that he cited in his magisterial texts. And so as being uh, worthwhile and informative 
in us understanding and development. Same thing with Benedict when he talks about uh, Trinitarian ontology and he talks about the idea that we're no longer just talking substance. We're talking about relation because it's Trinity. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because if it's just substance, we can explain oneness, but the relationship part brings in the many. And that's the, how we how we conceptualize the Trinity, for example. And that's how we conceptualize the family in reflection of that, by the light of that. And same thing with the church, same thing with the church in the world, same thing with the common good, all of those things. And it all harkens back to the Trinity. And so the Trinity gives us it, it, the foundations whereby we can make judgments, okay, where we can we can uh, understand particulars. Because if we, if, if I should just state this quickly, that when people talk about, well, I'm looking at a flower and I say, well, that flower is this. And I describe that flower and another person describes the flower and we're all looking at the particular. And I say, well, I, what I'm saying is that is real according to my thought of what real is. And they say, well, that's real according to my thought of what's real. The, the problem is, is what I call real. If it's just one thing, one thing, one thing is informed by that web I was talking about. But what is ultimately real, metaphysically? God's knowledge of all things. He has complete knowledge inside and out, from front to back, top to bottom, beginning to end, in and of itself, and all possibilities. He is the pre-interpreter of all things, which means when we know something, if we truly know it, we know it insofar as God knows it. We would not know it differently from God and God knows all things. So if we speak of something and we want to get outside of our individualist web and we want to get outside of that and not commit the, the, the fallacy of composition that says, I had an experience with three chicks, therefore all chicks are this. That's fallacy of composition, right? And I don't mean to be rude about chicks, but people, ladies, women, but men who talk that way about making these assumptions about the ladies as a whole sometimes base it off of very small sample sizes. Same thing with anybody talking about groups. That same logic is true about our personal experiences through the senses, even as an entire planet of people yeah, in a galaxy in and inside of a universe that is gigantic. Yeah, We'd I mean, have to then make assumptions about the world outside of that and say, I think it would be like that. Maybe it'd be like right. this. And major yeah. time shade. Yeah. Yeah, this makes a lot of sense. I, I just wanted to, we've got about five minutes left. I wanted Fowler to give his comments. I've just been going back and well, forth with you. Fowler, what are your what are your thoughts? <laughs> my my initial thought, so I was looking at the um, you know, you get the little time counter that that shows us how long we've been on air. And when Jeremiah started, it was at 18 minutes. And I presuppose that 42 minutes was not enough. And <laughs> I I think that that is coming true. Um, so I, I would say that this is not only an acceptable method, but it's, and I, I'm willing to be corrected on this. So feel free to bring the criticisms, everybody. But it seems to me that the classical apologetic method is sort of... It, almost trying to use the, well, let me take this piece and let me take this piece and let me take this piece. And I'm going to construct it in such a way that reflects the reality of God and the church and et cetera, et cetera. And so that I can go and present that to somebody else and that they, in their own mind will take, well, I like this piece of evidence. Well, I like this piece. Well, can you hone in your argument here? Well, can you hone in your argument there? And it seems to fall into the same trap as those who do that same thing to disprove or attempt to disprove God. And so it seems to me this is a more um, not only intuitive, but holistic approach that would take account of our being as relational persons in a moment in history. Uh, you know, I, I like to tell my friends who, who, who identify this or that crisis in the church, as, oh, if only we could be like this. And I thought, well, but God chose you to live right now, right? He, he plucked you in or plopped you in this moment of history and the way we experience things and the, the fact that the relations that we have with uh, the people around us uh, and, and with the Lord himself, the presuppositional method seems to me to be the only one that can really account for all of that without having to jump through 
the artificial hoops that atheists and non-believers prop up. So that that's why I like it. I don't fully understand it myself, right? Um, I was not, I, I am not a trained philosopher. So I'm sitting back, I'm like sipping my coffee and, and making faces at Jeremiah. And he's like, I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning. And I've tried to get him to, to flesh this out. And he has, you know, private conversations. He's probably spent four or five hours trying to explain this to me. Yeah. And I'm still like, mm, okay, I think I understand it. <laughs> um, but the, the more I hear it, the more I, I, it sort of makes me realize that not only is it the, the one system to rule them all, as it were, but it's it's the one that's most suited to us as um, embodied souls, right? We, you know, it, like he's been saying this whole time with the one and the many and with knowledge and how do you know that this thing is distinct from yourself? And uh, you're, you're talking to a person, you're presupposing that they're a person, as a matter of fact. So it's not solipsistic. It's all these other things. And it's just rolled into one package. And it, it's so intuitive. It's so intuitive that it's not at first glance the most reasonable thing or it doesn't seem to be. So, you know, we've had even even some banter in our chat about, well, this doesn't make sense. How can this because we're we're so full of other things, distractions. Right. And I don't just mean technological distractions, but bodily sensual sort of distractions right our, our day to day whatever you're occupied with that we don't often get a chance to reflect on the fact that i exist the fact that you guys exist the fact that um this cup of coffee is not like your cup of coffee although they're similar and when you do that you start to see the whole for what it is, right? And we'll never have an exhaustive, uh, you know, comprehension of it by any means uh, until God willing, we enjoy the beatific vision. But we can get a little slice of it. And then you can take this method and use it to help someone else get a little slice of it. And hopefully in so doing, bring them along to Holy Mother Church. Amen. Excellent. Paleo Krat, final, yeah. final comments. Final comments. So, I have two, I have multiple videos on these subjects. You can find them at the playlist. If you go into any of my videos, it'll say for a complete playlist, it's got my videos and Jake Fowler's videos. I'll link, um, I'll link that playlist in yep. the description of this video. And I'm making playlists today that will have just, just presuppositionalism as well as just different books I went through because I make the contention. Um, I'm not the only one on the first one. That is that. St. Irenaeus used this kind of method called the hypothesis canon system complex in his argument uh, against the heretics that St. Francis de Sales used that uh, when he converted nearly 70,000 people because of his efforts um, in the Chablais with his what he called his invincible argument of St. Matthew 18, which I contend may be uniquely risky business, but maybe that because it's about ultimate authority, it verifies itself. Um, and even the passage itself is trans you can uh, understand it transcendentally because Catholicism is the only uh, ecclesiology that if you plug it in, that it satisfies the conditions that would be required for that passage to even make sense. Um, but I would say this when number one, I would really encourage people in this here. This is the end of the book. Cardinal Avery, uh, Avery Cardinal Dulles does an excellent job. And in the end, he talks about presuppositionalism and he says there's an analogous kind of method with this that can be found among Catholics who following Augustine and Anselm. <laughs> and he goes through and he's describing what this could be, this thing. And he says Vatican II seems to endorse this style of argument. The Constitution of the Church of the Modern World, after speaking of the mystery of the human person in the light of Revelation, concludes through Christ and in Christ, the riddles of sorrow and death grow meaningful. I would simply say it's also those things. So it's a precondition to make sense of our sorrows or our sufferings or the other things that we have in our lives. And I would list just these as examples. Every debate you do, this is the last thing I'll say. Every debate you do, no matter what method you're using, if you're not a fideist and you're actually providing arguments to people and using reason and logic, if you're doing that, you are relying on some kind of a belief about the one and the many. 
you are relying on something that gives makes sense of intelligible experience, meaningful experience, meaningful words, value, purpose, logic, the universality of logic, that it's abstract, certainty, the uniformity of nature, induction, that you can say that the future will be like the past, right and wrong, good and evil, true, uh, truth and falsity. All of these things are kind of hidden, but you're using those all the time, every time you say something. And the question is, if the atheist is true, and if, if the agnostic, if the deist, if the uh, if the Talmudist, if the Mohammedan, if the Protestant, if any of these different groups, if they use that and they're using those tools and you press them on the issue of the Trinity. And by the way, in the in the comments, someone said that it's not because the Trinity, it's because God's attributes. They really they really should read uh, the paragraphs in the 200s, the 230s, I think, in the catechism talking about um, that the. The Trinity illuminates, right, this thing and that God's work reveals who he is in himself, the mystery and all that. And that it's within the Trinity, that the Trinity is the most central to all of those things. So we're not just talking about some abstract God. We're not just talking about an energy source, right? We're talking about God. Well, who's God? And the moment we say who's God, that affects it. I'm sorry. <laughs> in fact, that's exactly what we're talking about. We, I'm just saying we start with it. But the idea is if anybody using just like they're using truth to say there's no such thing as truth, just like they're using arguments to say that the reality is absurd, just like they're talking to you when they say that everything is one and they're trying to convince you of their belief. So you obviously are not one because you have two different things going on here. They are using beliefs that only make sense in our worldview and that if pressed, it doesn't mean their worldview doesn't make sense of anything. There are a lot of really intelligent people that do remarkable things, creating remarkable technologies and medicines, but they wouldn't be able to do that if they were not created in the likeness and image of God, which is our conclusion that we're trying to convince them of anyway. And if it would, so it's real as we're trying to convince them, it's still true, just as true. And that it wouldn't be true if they were not living and moving and having their being in the world that God created. And if those things were not true, Maybe, maybe it would make sense. But then again, I don't know how anything would make sense because this is the only world we've got. <laughs> and I look and say, well, in this world, to make sense of all of these things that I mentioned, value, purpose, uniformity, induction, all that that's essential to us talking, you need the Trinitarian God of Catholicism. Amen. Perfect. Well, thank you, Jeremiah, for presenting this. This has been very great for me to understand better. I think it's a fantastic concept and certainly eminently reasonable as far as i can tell i'm just more curious to to find out later some other time why are there these critics i don't get it so we'll have to answer the critics later like right now let's invoke our lady's seat of wisdom to implant in our brains what is eminently reasonable in accordance with the logos of god let's pray in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit amen Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.